everyone and welcome again. And today we'll be talking about the industrial chemistry topic. And in particular, we'll be looking at in sulfuric acid production. And in the last few lessons, we've talked about how we get sulfur, how we produce sulfuric acid. And now we're going to talk about the specific conditions for producing SO2 and SO3, which are the two main sort of intermediate products before we get to sulfuric acid. Okay. So here we have a representation of sulfur trioxide, one of the typical, one, one of the intermediates in the contact process. And so learning how to develop this efficiently is probably going to be um, the best way to maximize our sulfur, sulfuric acid production. So remembering that in order to produce sulf sulfur dioxide, we reacted sulfur in pure form with oxygen gas. Um, and it was dry. The air had to be dry. And that gave us the sulfur dioxide. Now the air can be dried by passing it over concentrated H2SO4. So there are many ways to dry air um, sort of industrially, but assuming that we're already producing this SO H2SO4, this sulfuric acid, we might as well use it um, in our process. So what we can do is if we pass the air over the sulfuric acid, it will actually desiccate the air or uh, remove the water from it. And you've seen when H2SO4 can actually dehydrate something, um, and that's through the ethanol production, uh, ethanol to ethylene production. If you put concentrated sulfuric acid with ethanol, it will actually suck the water away and give you ethylene, right? So that should ring some bells from production of materials. So you should know that by passing something over concentrated sulfuric acid, you'll, it will suck up a lot of that water. Now the heat from this reaction can also be used for other purposes like heating water for steam. So let's say you've already taken out that water. When it mixes with the sulfuric acid, it will actually produce more heat and you can use that heat for something else as well. So we can actually do a lot with this sulfuric acid and even use it to produce more sulfuric acid in this case. So SO2 can also be collected from metal smelters. So remembering from um, earlier topics, particularly um, with regard to acid rain, that metal smelting was one of the big contributors to sulfur dioxide in the air. And so if we can collect it before it gets to the atmosphere, then we can actually just use it. Um, it's exactly the same chemically, so why not just use it for this process and sort of kill two birds with one stone? Now, Moving to sulfur trioxide, like the harbor process, the conversion from this sulfur dioxide to sulfur trioxide, it's exothermic and equilibrium. Okay? So here's our reaction. So we have sulfur dioxide plus oxygen gives you sulfur trioxide plus 197 kilojoules. So it's quite strongly exothermic, and you can see that. Okay? So it will release heat to the atmosphere or to the system. Yeah, so high temperatures will actually reduce this yield, while of course low temperatures will reduce the reaction rate. So we're always kind of coming in contact with this, um, this compromise of increasing yield or decreasing the reaction rate. Because remembering that this is exponentially related to temperature, and this is of course related to the reaction rate as well. So we're always hitting that kind of catch-22, so we have to learn to optimize these things. So in order to sort of alleviate that problem, we use a vanadium oxide catalyst or a vanadium catalyst. And so that kind of meets a compromise between these two competing sets of reactions. So it can increase our yield while also lowering, uh, increasing our reaction rate as well. Um, so obviously the pressure of the system is also higher than atmospheric to increase yield. So same as the Harvard process, we want to really increase the pressure so that we can increase the, the yield of sulfur trioxide. Because remembering that that's one of our main intermediates before we get to sulfuric acid. And another way of doing this is by adding XX oxygen, we can actually also increase the yield. So because remembering that oxygen appears on the left-hand side, by putting more than what's necessary, it will always force the reaction to the right-hand side. So we can always kind of increase the amount of SO3 we produce by increasing the amount of oxygen that's available to the point where we can have more than what we actually need. And often that's more cost effective than using higher pressure. 
So we can easily kind of separate more oxygen into the stream, but making a very strong container for this process that can we'll, uh, sort of withstand high pressure is much more expensive. So what we'll tend to do is we'll tend to focus on increasing the excess oxygen simply to uh, limit the amount of costs that we incur by producing this sulfuric acid. So what happens then? So once we've got that sulfur trioxide, well then we can actually have, we can dissolve it in water, but what happens with that is that there's a large heat release, okay? So this creates a fine mist of sulfuric acid. So when you pump that sulfur trioxide um, into the water, or the sulfur dioxide as well, it will release a lot of heat. And that heat vaporizes the water, which will then create a mist of sulfuric acid, which of course is dangerous. So here you have that mist. So you can see it just on the top here. Um, and so um, what we have is a situation where there's actually vaporized sulfuric acid, which of course we can breathe in, and that would be a problem. So alternatively, what we do is instead of doing that, um, we, like we mentioned in the previous lesson, we'll pump it through more sulfuric acid. So the sulfur trioxide will be pumped through pure sulfuric acid, which will then create oleum, which we've talked about, which is an oily mixture, um, and it's H2S2O7. Now, when H2SO4 is required, all we have to do is add water to the oleum, okay? So that concludes today's lesson on the conditions of the contact process, as well as to produce SO2 and SO3. And so we looked at what kind of things we need to optimize to produce lots of SO2 and also lots of SO3, and then what we can do to sort of reduce the safety concerns when producing this sulfuric acid. So move on to the question segment now. So question seven, if we increase the pressure greatly and increase the ex and increasing the excess oxygen yield the same result in this equation, why is increasing the excess oxygen more cost effective? So if, for instance, increasing the pressure and the excess oxygen, um, they both give you the same result, why is the oxygen one more cost effective? Well, the main reason is that increasing the pressure will require stronger containers. Right, we need to build a you know, a bigger container, a stronger container um, that can extend more pressure. Um, and increasing the oxygen content can simply be achieved by diluting the mixture with more air or using a machine to actually remove the nitrogen from the air stream. Okay, so we can actually do that. We can remove nitrogen from the air and get pure oxygen into the environment and then we just keep pumping that in. Um, so that's actually a lot easier than buying very strong materials and building a very strong container. And so that means that it'll always be a little bit more cost effective. So it's always easier to do this by sort of low tech or low, low duty or not as um, light duty machinery um, than producing or purchasing really heavy duty equipment for high pressure applications. Okay, so question eight. So why is oleum the preferred product after forming the SO3? So why do we like oleum better? Um, so when SO3 dissolves in water, there's a big heat release. And that heat release causes the sulfuric acid to form a fine mist, and we don't want that. So this makes it difficult to extract the pure sulfuric acid. So yeah, that's an economic point, or a very technical point. But also in terms of safety, a mist of sulfuric acid is in no way a safe situation for anyone. So oleum is a liquid, right? It's just an oily, very heavy liquid. Um, that can be transported in metal containers with little risk. So we can put this oleum in a metal container as long as we don't have a lot of water there. We can transport it around in metal containers with no problems. So this is a much safer alternative to forming pure sulfuric acid because there's no mist, it's a liquid, it's safe to move in metal containers, and even if there is a little bit of water, um, there's still a buffer zone of it diluting itself. So it splitting into sulfuric acid, which can still be, still be safe. Okay, so this is why we like oleum a little better than we like producing sulfuric acid. Um, so question nine. Describe the process of converting oleum 
to sulfuric acid and what are the potential safety concerns. So what are we concerned about when we turn oleum back to sulfuric acid? Because I know many chemical uh, chemistry students haven't even heard of oleum until now. So of course we need to turn it back to the sulfuric acid at some point. So what are the safety concerns? So basically in order to do that first process of turning it back to sulfuric acid, we just add water. Okay, just simply add water. And that gives you two sulfuric acid molecules for every one oleum molecule. And remember that like all acid dilutions, um, it's very strongly exothermic. And so you've got to be careful that you avoid getting it as the acid on your skin. Okay. Now we add the water, the oleum to the water very, very slowly. Okay. And we always add the acid to the water for several reasons. Um, because remembering it's exothermic, we don't want it to sputter back out. And also because when you pour the acid into the water, the acid is probably denser. So it'll fall to the bottom. And so all that sputtering won't occur because it'll be falling to the bottom of the beaker anyway. Okay. So moving on to question 10. So now we'll actually answer the question, why is oleum added to water and not the other way around? So the reaction is strongly exothermic and the mixture will bubble and boil, spitting acid out of the container. So that's assuming that, of course, you put the water into the acid. Okay. So it will bubble and spit that acid back out. Now by adding water to oleum, because the oleum is denser than, than the water, the reaction will occur at the top of the mixture, allowing more acid to spill out. Okay. So here's our beaker. And if the oleum is here, you pour the water in from the top. Basically all of the top part, any water that hits the oleum will instantly vaporize and spit back out because of all that heat that you're releasing. So you've got a problem with you know um, all of this sulfuric acid, which is very concentrated, spitting back out of your container. So that's a safety concern. Now if we do it the other way, by adding the oleum to the water, um, the oleum will sink, reducing the sputtering um, due to the water. So in this case, now we have the water at the bottom. If we have the oleum going in, the oleum will actually just sink and slowly dissolve, or actually rapidly dissolve, but it will sink to the bottom. So the sputtering won't occur as much because the heat release will be towards the bottom where it will have to get through lots of um, water to get to the top. So that concludes today's lesson on the conditions required for sulfuric acid production. So we've looked at how we optimize SO3 production and how we optimize SO2 production. And so I hope you've learned something from this lesson and I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson. Thank you.